Hey everyone, just uh, checking in, 16 minutes past, sorry, a minute late. Um, give us a thumbs up if you can hear us there. No, oh, Anton said no, that's not good. Angelique, yes, if we get a couple more yeses or a thumbs up, we'll get going. Brian, cool. Great. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone to another week of Lunch Money. We do these every Thursday uh, at lunchtime. My name's Leighton. I'm one of the co-founders of Sharesies. Uh, this is Sonia. She's also one of the co-founders of Sharesies. Uh, and today we're really stoked to be uh, joined by Janae uh, Tipsharani, who you would have seen on here before. She's a journalist at interest.co.nz. Um, Janae is based in the Parliamentary Press Gallery, so would have been extremely busy uh, over the last couple of weeks. And she reports on personal finance and policy that affects the economy. Um, just a reminder that if you have any questions, you can submit them through the ask a question button that you should be able to see down below. We don't really follow the chat along the side, so make sure they get into there. Uh, quick legal disclaimer, we don't give any personalised advice, so we talk about a lot of things, but it's all broad based and uh, we don't know your personal situation, so check with someone first. Uh, please be kind and respectful also uh, towards our speakers and your fellow viewers, otherwise uh, we have to take steps to remove you from the webinar and we definitely do not want to have to do that either. Uh, I'll hand over to Sonia to, for today's market update. Excellent. Kia ora. Um, so the markets have been pretty flat this week. Any uncertainty that was there towards the end of last week um, driven by the NZ election has now gone. Um, obviously that, uh, the results are in and um, Labour's victory in the 2020 NZ election, um, which we will definitely be going into uh, when Janae joins us in more detail. Um, but that any uncertainty around that has now gone, um, but then there is the focus now on the impact of the US election, uh, which is taking place uh, on November 3rd in the States, um, which kind of makes it around the 4th-ish in New Zealand. Um, so that's uh, obviously driving some uncertainty there. Um, in other news, uh, economics consultancy uh, Infometrics um, is forecasting uh, that there will be 186,000 fewer jobs by the middle of next year, along with the drop in the number of hours worked and weaker earnings growth. There's a quote here from their chief forecaster, Gareth Kernan, who said, if the employment unemployment rate does climb over 8% next year, Infometric expects a contraction of more than 3% in both private consumption spending and GDP for the first nine months of 2021. So just to de-jargon that, <laughs> um, Infometrics are forecasting if there are less people working, so if unemployment rises, uh, that will lead to less spending and will also lead to a lower GDP. Um, so that's a forecasting that's been put out. Um, in share market news, uh, retirement village company MetLife Care is set to delist from the New Zealand Stock Exchange. And this is after the High Court gave its $1.3 billion takeover offer from Asia Pacific Village Group, The Green Light. So what this means is if you still own shares in MetLife Care on the delisting date, uh, you will be paid $6 per share and this will be paid into your wallet. Which, and it, so it kind of works the same as if you were just selling your shares, um, but it happens at a fixed price and this will be taking place in early November. Uh, so also homeware and sports good retailer Briscoe's Group um, has repaid 11.5 million that it received in wage subsidies after reporting a $28 million half year profit last month. Um, and also uh, this morning, Rua Bioscience um, IPO'd. And what that means is it's initial public offering. That's what IPO stands for. And this is when a company goes from being privately held uh, to publicly available. And this means uh, it's also available on sharesies. And uh, so it's the first IPO since Napier Port, which happened last year. And uh, we were actually able to offer access to the IPO to our sharesies investors and this started trading on the market this morning. Um, so there's also some US company news. Uh, they've started reporting their earnings for the quarter in September. So Snap, also known as Snapchat, um, announced that their revenue numbers are up more than 50% on the same period of last year. Um, IBM, which is the consulting company, announced declining revenues in part um, due to its, ex its exposure to industries such as retail, transportation um, that have been impacted by the pandemic. And 
Procter and Gamble have announced revenue numbers above expectations fueled by demand for its cleaning and laundry products during the pandemic. So um, heaps going on, <laughs> and um, but the election is obviously top of mind. So uh, on that, I'll pass to you, Leighton. Yeah, thanks, Sonia. Opportunities can come in funny places. Uh, you know, one of the things I didn't consider as an opportunity uh, during the lockdown and stuff was laundry products, I suppose, but there we go. Um, let's welcome Janae. So um, hopefully she'll be with us here any second. There she Hi guys. is. Hey Janae, how, how are you? Good, good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, look, thank you for joining us again. Um, you've obviously been us on Large Money before, um, but for those who don't know you, uh, could you just run us through who you are, what you do, and what's your story? Sure, so um, my name is Janae, and I'm a um, journalist for interest.co.nz, which is a sort of uh, financial uh, news website, and I'm based in Wellington in the Parliamentary Press Gallery. I report on um, economic matters um, and also how they relate to politics and also um, report on stuff that the Reserve Bank does. And yeah, so I mean, uh, just to, as another disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor, but I do um, take an interest in economic matters. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, let's kick straight into it. Uh, Saturday was election day. Uh, can you give us a quick rundown of what happened? Any highlights from your point of view? You know, any things you can let us in on that you saw that maybe the rest of us don't get to, and then also what happens from here? Yeah, sure. So on election night, I was at the Labour Party's um, Labour Party HQ at the Auckland Town Hall, and um, yeah, it was actually a, a t the, the mood was pretty it was quite chill. I thought that there'd be a bit more hype. Um, everyone was pretty calm, but then as I, I was in the media room, I'm um, filing a live blog, and as the results started coming in, I think everyone was pretty surprised because um, all these blue seats were going red. And while everyone expected, um, obviously, Labour to um, get more support than National, the results were pretty surprising. So, um, yeah, so when I, I went out into the main area where everyone was, and obviously when Justin Rardoon came on stage, it was a, a pretty big uh, eruption of applause and, and all the Labour supporters were, were pretty stoked. And then I think afterwards, some of the MPs were probably just a bit shell-shocked by the result. Um, probably far exceeded their expectations. So um, yeah, and then back in Wellington, uh, the, the MPs have been straight to work and there are all these new people who are coming to Parliament. Like it'll look quite different now with new Labour MPs and also a whole bunch of new ACT MPs. So they've been inducted and um, I had a chance to, to meet some of them yesterday, which which was nice. Always interesting to see the difference between people who come into Parliament for, for the first time versus people who have been in the place for a while. But yeah, there's an they interesting mix of candidates. They did, they did, they, they did, they didn't look too jaded, which was nice. <laughs> yeah, right. And you, you obviously got yourself positioned in the. Um, yeah, I imagine there was another far more sombre camp um, to be at as well. Was there someone? How did you end up scoring to, um, the option to be with the Labour headquarters? Given we sort of knew that that's where it was heading based on early polls. Yeah, versus, I... um, the other options. Yeah, I just went to, to Labour HQ because um, the, the polls suggested that, that they'd be the ones celebrating on the night. But I mean, it, a, a really sombre affair for National and um, I think they'll do quite a lot of navel gazing now as to, to, you know, what they could have done better. Obviously, it was a pretty tough gig for them, just given the, um, the Labour-led government's success in managing COVID. So I think Judith Collins always had a tough job and then obviously all the changes of leadership didn't help. And also the effect that that had on the, their policy and the way that they announced their policy. Um, I, I thought that the policy mix could have been a little bit slightly better structured. It seemed to be some of it was a little bit here, a little bit there. So while I think some of the media is going on about the internal issues with National, I think they also need to look at their policies and, and how they position themselves, like like what, you know, what, what they're offering voters. Um, I think that, that'll probably be a focus for them now as well. Yeah, cool. So now that the election's been decided, um, we're just going to d dig into some a few areas of what uh, a Labour-led government might mean for New Zealanders over the next few years. Um, so when we think about economic recovery, um, Labour has led the health response to COVID this year. Now people are keen to see what economic recovery might look like. Um, so what does this plan look like under Labour? And what does this mean for Kiwi businesses, Kiwis and the wider economy? Sure. 
Okay, so I think the thing that Labor's really campaigned on is that they will provide um, stability and that they've been managing the books up until now, they've been managing the COVID response. And this is the proposition they put to voters. They said, look, we've been doing it, we've been doing it all right. If you just re-elect us, we'll just keep keep doing what we're doing. And I mean, in some respects, that that is a fair point, that stability and continuity is a good thing, instead of having new people come in and have to get their feet under the desk and, and um, learn the ropes again. I think um, well, financial markets, at least, have welcomed that um, stability that Labor provides. Uh, in terms of the economic recovery, uh, it's, they've been slightly less clear on exactly what that will look like, in all fairness. That, 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 both Labour and National are just keen to, to grow the economy and I suppose we've seen the wage subsidy has been a support that um, the Labour-led government has been willing to, to provide to keep people employed. Um, my assumption is that if we have to go into another lockdown, um, they will provide that again. Um, but then looking longer term, investment in infrastructure is Labour's uh, proposition. The difficulty with that though is that we can plan to have all these uh, new uh, water and road and rail projects, um, but delivering them will be a challenge, making sure that we have the skills um, and the capacity to deliver these, and also making sure that they can get off the ground quickly enough so that there isn't sort of this lull this year and next year. That'll be a challenge. Um, in terms of for businesses, something that they might not be as happy with is uh, Labor's commitment to increasing the minimum wage um, again and also um, increasing uh, sick leave entitlements from five days to 10 days a year. So that's quite an interesting debate actually, you know, as, as to an argument is that if you increase the minimum wage, that puts more money in the pockets of lower income people, which means they spend it, which stimulates the economy. But an argument against that is that, um, you know, now's not the time to be putting more pressure on businesses because we want them to hire people to keep people employed. So I think the main thing though, um, really is, keeping people employed, keeping them in jobs, I think that'll be uh, a focus. Also trades training, I should say that um, there's sort of, I think it's free training for, for trades. So I think that that's another key thing that is in Labor's plan, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you for that. Um, the other hot topic has been around housing, uh, particularly the house prices and um, the rising house prices. So what does this Labour-led government mean for house prices or the housing market? Yeah, this is something that really uh, it gets me going. I don't know if anyone's been to open homes recently, but I went um, a couple of weekends ago in Auckland and it was a, it was a, it was a sorry state. But um, look, I guess the, the government's challenge is, is that the central bank, the reserve bank, is doing everything it can to lower interest rates because the idea is that if interest rates are lower, then people will borrow more and they'll spend more and invest and that'll stimulate the economy. But because the reserve bank is cutting interest rates and because we already have a housing shortage, that's seeing those um, house prices shoot up. Now, uh, Labor and National have committed to reforming the RMA to try to get more houses built, also looking at things like urban development policy statements that look at sort of planning rules, which once again up supply. Um, Labor's in the previous term done things to curb demand as well, like extend the bright line test and ban foreign buyers um, from buying residential property. But, you know, when you're working with the Reserve Bank, who's going gung-ho to lower interest rates to encourage investment, and that's boosting prices, you know, it's pretty hard for the government to try to do anything to counter that. And in all fairness, I don't believe there's a whole lot of will to do that either because, um, you know, I think it's more than half of New Zealanders own houses and if their house prices are going up, they feel wealthier, they spend more um, and that makes everyone feel more confident. So I suppose the government doesn't want to shape that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's probably the biggest debate at the moment because, um, you know, you have to wonder whether it is getting to the point where Sure, there are a whole bunch of people whose houses are becoming worth more, but there's another bunch who are being locked out of the housing market um, and who aren't benefiting from those capital gains and who aren't benefiting from um, lower rent payments, for example. So people with mortgages are paying, their, their mortgage payments have gone down because of those interest rates going down, but people renting, their rents aren't going down. So I think, it, in my mind, this is probably the biggest discussion that... Um, 
that we need to have, really, is that relationship between what the Reserve Bank's doing and what the government's doing, and kind of where we want to go as a country on this issue. Yeah, actually, and just one more thing, um, I should say, a, a, a point of difference, perhaps going ahead, that Labor is doing with housing, is that it's um, committing to underwriting housing developments. So this means if you're a developer, you can go to the government and say, look, I want to build a 1,000 houses, but the bank is being really risk adverse because of COVID and doesn't, it doesn't want to lend me the money unless I can say I've already sold a whole bunch of these houses off the plans before they're built. So the government's saying, look, developer, if you, if you can't sell those houses, we will buy them from you at below market rate. Um, so that's what they've done with Kiwi Build, and now Labor is looking to expand that underwrite system more widely to encourage, to take some of the risk from developers to encourage them to build more. So I think that's something that hasn't received a whole lot of uh, attention, but that is kind of an interesting new policy to, to up supply. And um, there's been a question from the audience around whether there'll be any uh, foreseeable tax benefits for homeowners, um, especially first home buyers under labour. Do you have anything to add around that? Um, look, I think Jacinda Ardern has ruled out um, introducing a capital gains tax. So, um, and even if they did bring in a capital gains tax, that exclude the family home. So presumably if you're first home buyer, that won't be taxed. Um, Labor's also committed to not introducing any new taxes other than that new income tax rate um, for above 180000 a year. So I think at this point, you're, it's, it's a pretty safe bet in terms of tax and property. Unless you're an so, investor then and then there's the bright line test. Yeah. Cool, thanks for that. Um, so then let's talk about debt. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around government debt, um, especially around borrowing money to deal with the impacts of COVID. Can you explain what government debt is and um, where they get the money from and how Labor plan plans, uh, plans to pay it back? Sure. Okay, so what happens is, is the, the government, so that's Treasury, um, they issue bonds, which is an asset, but that's debt to the market. And they say, look, Mark, we're issuing these bonds. We'd like you to buy them, and that's how we get money. So Treasury issues bonds. Uh, investors, like um, your KiwiSaver fund managers and banks and people from New Zealand and overseas, they buy these bonds. But because Treasury is issuing so many bonds, because they're taking out so much debt into the market, the Reserve Bank has gone, whoa, um, the market might get a bit overwhelmed, flooded with all these bonds, we will intervene and we will tell the people who buy the bonds, the banks and so on, that they can on sell those bonds to us. So the Reserve Bank has said we will buy up to $100 billion of these bonds from the banks and so on who buy them. So from Treasury to the banks to the Reserve Bank. And to date, the Reserve Bank has bought $35 billion of these bonds. So the Reserve Bank basically invents money, it figuratively prints it to buy the bonds from the banks who have bought it from the government. So it's a kind of uh, bit of a money go round really, it's basically just the Reserve Bank printing money and that debt going basically just from one arm of government to another arm, if, if that makes sense, I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, and the way that the government plans to repay it is basically just the idea is if we keep growing the economy, people will keep paying tax and our tax, the government's tax revenue will increase and over time that debt will just be run down. That's I think, and just, nice. yeah, and just on the issue of debt, it's not, I think there's possibly been a bit of fear mongering that's happening around it. Like obviously you don't want to have crazy amounts of debt, um, but New Zealand went into the crisis with a really low level of debt, 20% of GDP, that will increase, but compared to other countries, it's still pretty low. And it's basically just moving numbers from one balance sheet to another balance sheet. Um, the, the time that debt gets really bad is if it affects our currency or if credit rating agencies think New Zealand's a bit of a banana republic and if there's too much inflation. So if all this money being pumped into the economy to stimulate it, if, if that becomes way too inflationary, then, then that becomes an issue. Or also, if there's too much money in the economy and not enough people to like do anything with the money, so the money's there and there are no infrastructure projects being done or, or there's no sort of tools to, to use that money in a productive way. To me, that's when it becomes a, pro a major problem. 
Thanks, Janae. That sort of flows in nicely to our um, next question, which was around uh, QE or uh, quantitative easing and uh, the OCR, the official cash rate. So um, maybe you could quickly just, um, for those who haven't heard it before, but de jargon those two terms for us. Yeah, sure. So, um, so once again, we've got the Reserve Bank, which sits sits separate to the government, and it has a mandate to keep inflation um, at between one and three percent and employment at a sustainable level. And the idea is, is that if those two uh, things are met, then that is a sign of a like a healthy economy. So that's one of its main jobs, and it has a bunch of tools that it has that it can use to achieve those goals. And the tool that it's used mostly to date is um, changing the official cash rate. So if it lowers the official cash rate, that lowers interest rates. And the idea is, as I said before, that gets people to borrow, invest, spend, um, and to try to boost inflation. Now, coming into this crisis, the official cash rate was already super low. So the Reserve Bank had to go back into its toolkit, find some new things to do to lower those interest rates more, because it wants them even lower than what they are now. So that's why it started doing the quantitative easing. As I said before, where it, bu it buys all these bonds from the secondary market. And basically, long story short, if it does that a lot, intervenes heaps in the market, that lowers interest rates. So it's doing that. It also, the quantitative easing, as I said before, it also helps calm markets. Because if you're an investor and suddenly the market's flooded with bonds, it could be distortionary. So that quantitative easing kind of does two things. It calms, calms the markets and it lowers the interest rates. And now, um, I guess looking ahead, the Reserve Bank is looking at creating and using a new tool, and that's basically what it's looking to do is uh, lend money to banks at a really low rate, so that banks then lend that money on to people and businesses at a really low rate as well, to, to push it even further. Because the Reserve Bank reckons that if they could lend to banks for really cheap, like cheaper than what banks can get the money from from overseas or from term deposits, then that's another way of lowering interest rates. So currently it's designing this, it's called a funding for lending program, and it's yet to announce whether it'll implement it. And then on top of that, it's looking at um, potentially going negative with the OCR. So, I mean, we've never seen this kind of thing in New Zealand before. The Reserve Bank's throwing everything at it, um, and its kind of idea is that uh, if it does this, it, it wants to keep people in jobs, it wants to keep the economy um, buoyed that way. And I mean, the side effect, as I said before, is those house prices, which are soaring. And I mean, people are becoming more and more critical of the Reserve Bank, but its view is that, look, we're just going to go full out, keep people in jobs, keep the economy going well, keep homeowners feeling confident and spending money. And if that means other people can't get houses, then sorry about it, we can't do it all. So the Reserve Bank's tools are really blunt and and, and super powerful. So, yeah, so I'm really interested in, and so the market's hugely interested in everything the Reserve Bank does. Yeah, none of this bodes particularly well um, for savings accounts, does it? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so if you're an, uh, potentially like an older person who's living off um, term deposits, you were hoping to get a 5% safe return or something like that, you're now looking at, I don't know, I don't even know what it is now, like 0.5% or 1%. Um, and I think you're lucky to get 1% at the moment. Right. I was looking at them the other day and it's below, dropped below 1% basically across the curve now. So whether you go for 90 days term deposit or 10 year term deposit, you're basically below 1%, which is, uh, and when you're looking um, at that curve, of course, or what we call the curve, that's your the interest rates over time it's basically um, trying to predict into the future what things might look like in 10 years so the whole lower interest rates for longer is is um, quite far into the future now in fact I think to get over one percent uh, based on that curve at the moment it's something like 30 years so it's, it's a very long way out um, to, to get a term deposit so uh, it's super crazy to think that I think under the last governor, even four or five years ago, we, we actually increased the OCR and interest rates went up again for a little bit, but mm. um, that certainly sorted itself out. Hey, um, so that sort of, let's bring it back to, and we've obviously got a whole lot of investors listening. So mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about a bunch of things from the um, larger sort of economic point of view. The houses one, uh, of course, is super interesting to heaps of people for many reasons. Um, but there's also uh, the fact that we've had an election. I mean, I mean, 
was it even a dot on the radar for investors this time? Like, was it big enough given everything else that is going on? Um, how have you seen the market react to it? Yeah, I mean, you guys are probably uh, more experts in this than I am, and the same with people watching this. But um, in my view, it's been a really muted response. Uh, the polls suggested that there'd be a Labour-led government. The, the big question is whether Labour would team up with the Greens. And um, as everyone knows, they don't have to. They have enough, they received enough support to govern on their own. I think I received some um, notes from, you know, investment banks and things saying that um, they were concerned if the Greens were really involved in a kind of more formal way, maybe that created some nervousness. But I think it's pretty muted. Um, I think the main thing is that stability and continuity. I mean, things that investors could look out for as well is the fact that um, the government's pretty dead set on, um, at, for now at least, eliminating COVID. So the borders look to remain closed, and that will obviously have an effect on international tourism, international students and aviation. Something that's probably something to keep in mind. Um, things like TY Point is an interesting one that I, I'm quite interested in and how that, how what um, Rio Tinto does, how that affects energy, the energy sector and some of those utilities. I'm not sure if the response would be hugely different if it was Labour or, or national led government, but that is, is probably one to watch. Um, yeah, sorry, I think it's quite a boring answer, really, but yeah. <laughs> no, I, and I would say, um, you know, from how the, Sonia mentioned in her market update earlier, but the markets have reacted sort of similar to that, really, um, in that not a lot of reaction at all, sort of what you'd call priced into, um, and even largely to things like TY Point. So it, it is interesting to see, given everything that's going on, it's like almost enough certainty that it's levelled out to a point of, all right, this is our this is our risk level for this amount of uncertainty or something like that. It's um, quite interesting. Um, so let's talk about what's next. What what do you think? Anything in particular um, you'll be keeping an eye on as a journalist? The things that are interesting you in particular, um, and things that investors should be keeping an eye on. Yeah, look for me, um, all eyes are on what the Reserve Bank does. Uh, the political decisions being made at the moment. The, the government, the, the Labour led government, is is super risk averse. Basically, like there are things that it could be doing. Um, I think we talked about helicopter money before. You know, something that it could do is say, look, Reserve Bank, you print that money and you buy some of those bonds to keep the bond markets calm, so that the investors don't panic because of all the bonds. But instead of being super involved in that market, why don't you print some of that money? give it to the government and let the government give it to people like through cash payments. So that could be like increasing benefits or it could be to vouchers for people to spend like at tourism businesses or, or, or you know, doing the stimulus a different way instead of just doing it through the banking system. Things like that that could be done, they kind of, they might seem a bit wild, other countries are doing them, but this government has just said, no, we don't want to do that. And I think as well, because it is a Labour-led government, um, they don't want to do anything that would be seen as mildly wacky because then people will say, oh, you know, the left, they don't know how to do money and, and they absolutely nailed. So I think the um, risk aversion is is interesting. I mean, there are pros and cons, different people have different views on that. Um, but things are, so sorry, sidetrack. Things I'd be interested in are the Reserve Bank, um, whether it reintroduces loan to value ratio restrictions, those are those LVRs, and they restrict bank lending against property. So um, since 2013, we had those restrictions on it, sort of kept a tiny bit of a lid on on property. Then with COVID, the Reserve Bank took them away because it thought we don't want to put anything in the way of banks lending. We want them to lend, we want people to invest. And now investors are piling into the property markets, taking off. Some people are saying, oh, Reserve Bank, maybe you need to put those restrictions back on. So in November, um, there's a financial stability report that the Reserve Bank releases and it'll provide some commentary around those restrictions then. So that's what I'm looking at. Also, I'm looking at whether it will introduce that funding for lending program that I talked about before, where it lends to the banks for cheap, and also whether it signals an OCR cut for next year. Um, I have written some notes on what else I've been thinking about. Oh, yeah, and then back to the government. So away from the Reserve Bank, back to the government, I'm interested in whether there will be much welfare reform. So the, the previous government did this massive review into welfare. All these recommendations were made. The government said, yep, we like it, but didn't implement a whole lot of it. I'd be interested to see if that is implemented. 
that might be one way of curbing this inequality that I think we'll see more of as people who own assets, those assets become worth more, people who don't own assets miss out on those gains. Um, yeah, and then I mean just a bit of the politics that will go on as well in Parliament, that might be interesting, heaps of new faces, um, it could provide a bit of entertainment, but I mean that's all just kind of beltway side stuff. Yeah, yeah great, thank you. I was thinking while you were talking earlier, like the, um, I mean, one of the explanations, no one here will uh, not have heard that, you know, that the markets possibly don't reflect the economy is, well, certainly in a more traditional view of looking at it. Um, and one way of explaining that is a, a reflection on sort of the change in risk premium. You know, it's like, well, now with interest rates so low, the risk, don't, you know, what risk I'm prepared to take for better return is higher as a result of that. And, and uh, like what you were just saying just sort of made me realise how much the government must be thinking about that as well. Like if they're prepared to underwrite property development, that means basically that they think the risk of not having enough houses is higher than the potential financial risk of them. So lots of these traditional dynamics are changing. Um, mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, so super interesting time to, to be a journalist. Like I, I think you'll you'll have amazing things to talk about on podcasts for years and years to come. Because um, yeah, <laughs> I've become a bit, I've become, yeah, it's become become a bit obsessed with the housing situation. Though. I think my friends are sick of it because every time I just want to talk about it. But um, I mean, it does raise an interesting question though that um, between the Reserve Bank and the government, <clears throat> that we're creating so much of the country's wealth is tied up in housing, and and all the policy levers that they've pulled with COVID is just basically supporting people with mortgages because it's so massive that if that crumbles, that'll affect the whole economy. But then the more support that they give the housing market, the bigger it gets and the, the, you know, and then we need to keep supporting it and it just creates this behemoth. So um, it's pretty interesting philosophical debate because no one is underwriting, um, like if I invest in a company and the company fails, then tough luck, the, the government's not taking on any of that risk. But it, it does seem to be happy to take on risk with property investment. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, Sonia, I'll hand over to you for the Q&A. Excellent. So we'll just jump into some um, questions from the audience. Um, and Janae will try and keep answers uh, like 20 seconds uh, as a bit of a quick fire round, um, see how many we can get through. So this is the most voted uh, question. Um, what are your comments on recreational cannabis bill in New Zealand? What impact will this bill have on companies that are on the NZX who are into manufacturing medicinal cannabinoid derivatives? Um, and I think it was like, would like to know how the impact of share price, share price fluctuation and impact on New Zealand economy if this bill passes. So a bit of a mouthful there, but I think um, it's around what impact do you think the recreational cannabis bill will have on New Zealand? Uh, I don't know. I don't know, sorry. I think there'll be a bit more tax take, but I think in the context of all the things happening, it's not a structurally big thing. Um, Cool, thanks for that and thanks Sorry. for asking that. No, no, you're okay. Um, so, uh, the NZ Refining Company um, news, any update on these? Um, Leighton, did you have a view on that? Maybe that's one for you. NZ Refining, I don't have any context for that one at the moment. I'm sorry. Cool. Thanks oh, for asking that, Anton. No, no, I haven't followed that. Um, sorry, we couldn't answer that one, but thanks for asking it. Um, so I'm interested in your thoughts on the impact of the US election on global and New Zealand share market. So this one's from Douglas. Any thoughts on that, Janae? Um, I not, must admit I haven't been following US politics really closely, but for definite the impact of the US election will be much bigger than <laughs> any impact of the New Zealand election. I believe all eyes are on the fiscal um, package that, and, and whether that'll go through, so whether the US government will keep providing um, support for companies and households. If it, I guess, indicates that any of that support or investment will pull back, then that'll have a, a really big effect. Once again, in the US, their Federal Reserve, so their central bank is also doing heaps to try to stimulate their economy in the same way that our central bank is. So, um, yeah. There's, there's also that, that dynamic over there. Excellent, thank 
you. Um, the next question is about housing, but I think we've covered that in our conversation, so I'll just skip over that one. Um, and so this one is from Gordon. Um, who is going to fit the large expenditure bill the government has spent over COVID? Um, I, I think you've kind of talked about that, but um, this is around like, will this affect our GB, GDP, our currency, and uh, investors and first time property buyers? So any extra thoughts to add on that one? Yeah, so there are two schools of thought. There are people, um, act like the ACT Party, for example, and it believes that we shouldn't have too much debt and we should cut government spending, cut out all these programs, like it wants to slash Callaghan Innovation and um, cut, you know, KiwiSaver contributions that government makes and things like that, because it reckons if the government spends less, that puts more money in people's pockets and they'll spend more and that'll stimulate the economy. There's another school of thought, which is a perhaps a more left-wing one, which is that if the government keeps investing and keeps borrowing, that is actually really stimulatory and that means uh, people spend more and then our economy grows. So two different views. Where we've landed is, is probably more towards the borrow side. Um, once again, as I said before, I think we should, as opposed to fixating on debt, we should fixate on outcomes. Like, are people employed? You know, are prices continuing to go up? And have that as the goal as opposed to have, having debt as a goal? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, uh, so, there has been talks uh, that the US wants to delist Chinese companies off the US stock exchange. Um, is, has anyone got thoughts on this? Janae, are you across that at all? No, no, I'm not. Leighton, are you across the Chinese, um, US wanting to delist Chinese companies? And any thoughts no. on what those consequences would be? Some some bad relationship stuff, I would imagine, but um, the relationships are not exactly fantastic uh, over there as it goes. So I think there's probably lots of chat about lots of things, but um, not something I have any sort of informed opinion on. Cool. And then, um, so then this one is around, um, with the GDP and unemployment numbers, coupled with no international tourists and little immigration, uh, with then coupled with favourable tax rates in Australia compared to New Zealand. Should this have an impact on our house prices and what's what's your view? Um, yeah, so immigration is, net immigration is actually really low, obviously because people aren't coming in. So uh, there's perhaps a narrative that there's high levels of immigration because there's all these uh, returning New Zealanders, but actually um, the net is, is way down. But as I said before, because of the, the interest rates being low, as long as those interest rates are low uh, and there's no tax on property, then people will just keep investing in it because it makes sense and the prices will keep going up and up, I think. I mean, they might hit a level. I thought that that level had been hit ages ago, but they've still continued to go up. So I think as long as interest rates remain low, we'll see property remain elevated. And last question from Gary. Um, with New Zealand first gone this time around, will the provincial fund be readdressed to new goals um, and what kinds of things um, would they sink money into? Good question. So the $3 billion um, allocated or that had been set aside for the provincial growth fund, that isn't, we're not getting a new $3 billion. Um, so that was a three year thing or a $3 billion thing, sorry, that's, that's now closed, but um, the, the government is investing a lot in various regional projects through different funds in response to COVID. So um, areas of focus, I guess infrastructure would be one. I know like there's a lot happening with water, like wastewater, drinking water, storm water, that sort of investment. Uh, yeah. Sorry to, I can't think of anything more specific off the top of my head, but I think that with all this, the, the government is definitely throwing it out around a lot more cash than it did pre-COVID, even if it's not through the Provincial Growth Fund as, as the mechanism. Cool, oh, thanks. That's it for the questions. Leighton, do you want to wrap yeah, it up? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. We'll um, we'll wrap that up. It's nearly one o'clock. That went really, really fast. Thanks uh, so much again, Janae, for sharing um, your uh, your expert opinions and uh, all the information that you pick up over there. Uh, 
particularly fascinating. Well, I'm sure that it's always a fascinating job, but I, I, I just don't know that if there's been a time in the last 30 years where it's been more interesting. So yeah. um, thanks, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, it's been great to speak with you again. Next Thursday, we're going to be joined by Justine Smythe. Uh, Justine is the chair of Spark New Zealand, uh, the chair of Breast Fo uh, Cancer Foundation New Zealand and a director of Auckland International Airport. Um, and we'll pop the link in the chat now so that you can register um, to, to hear us have a chat with Justine and um, ask her any questions you'd like as well. Um, have a great afternoon. Thanks so much again, Janae, and we'll catch up soon, I hope. Cool, thanks yeah. everyone, see ya. Thanks, Janae.